All right, everyone. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and welcome to the Friday Masterclass here on Adobe Live, also being simulcast to Behance and YouTube. Great to see you all. Hope you had a great week. It's Friday. And today I'm starting um, a new series, well, a series of masterclasses, all back to basics. So it's funny, right before the um, July shutdown break, <clears throat> I had a bunch of people uh, contacting me via Twitter and elsewhere after that 10,000 hour stream about, hey, you know, I got inspired to like start using Premiere, right? Putting in my hours, putting in my iterations and um, struggling to find like just how to's like where to start and there's lots of videos around it and what about something in the latest version so i have a bunch of series where i did a whole complete run through of everything and how to get started and finish called how to make great videos they're from 2017 2018 they're still very timely and all the info is still valid but there have been a lot of changes along the way obviously in the last three to four years so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing back to basic streams here. And today we're really going to focus on the fundamentals of starting your first edit in Premiere Pro. So if you've never used Premiere or you've kind of used it, but you've fumbled your way through, this is really meant to take you through the basics of getting started and specifically around these topics. <laughs> so we're going to start by, you know, starting the new project and looking at that first screen, importing footage, uh, content view and selection and something new, which wasn't in the older videos, freeform view for organizing your content, um, creating a sequence from that content. We're going to go through all the various editing tools and the tools panel. Again, a lot of these things have shortcuts and other ways to, to leverage them. We're actually going to go to the tool directly and just kind of show you what they do. Talk a little bit about playback settings and optimizing hardware playback. Um, again, not getting too deep into the weeds with all of the settings. That stuff, I went back to some of my older videos. I spent 30 minutes talking about all the various settings before inputting a single piece of footage. I'm not going to do that to you here. <laughs> that's valid info, but that's not what this is meant to be. This is really going to help you kind of just get started a little bit faster. And then just some basic editing uh, 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 accoutrement transitions, right? If you're not going to do straight cuts and you want some kind of transition, well, you have options. You can use classic things like cross dissolves or film dissolves or, you know, fade to black, fade to white or, you know, various other traditional ones. Or you can leverage graphical transitions, things which you might find uh, via the Essential Graphics panel, via Adobe Stock. And of course, we have thousands of free graphical transitional elements. And you can use your own as well. We can talk a little bit about that. OK, I want to remind everyone, of course, that uh, I will be following the chat here at b.net slash Adobe Live. So while I see some of you on my channel here, hey, what's up, Rick? Unique gamers, me new, what's amazing? How are you? <laughs> I'll be seeing you later today. Uh, Eric, great to see you all. And I see we've got Allison and Glenn Roy and Z by HP and Reverb Mike in the house doing comedy. Great to see you. Cody Bear loves a good bass extreme. Steve Festus Kosaboom, Rob and Bliss, AKA Golden Rose, Dale Anderson. Wonderful to see you all. Uh, Ferry, nice to see you too. Rick Adams, Trisana, all right, and everybody else. Okay, so again, um, I've got all of this in front of me, but I'm really following this chat here. So if you wanna ask questions or kind of get them in front of me, that is where you're going to want to be. Okay, so without further ado, let me, um, click over to Premiere. Oh, and one other just real quick thing. So for those of you who did catch the uh, the 10,000 hour stream the other day where I was showcasing my <laughs> my nine year old's journey from, you know, stick figure man to uh, to manga illustrator. So this was uh, the last two days. Just thought I'd share real quickly, you know, just show you that things are still still moving along. It's always about the journey. So this was yesterday. And I think is this this character's name? Is it is it Neko or Deco? I can't keep up with all the names. Or is this Goku? I think this is Goku. I I, I can't remember. Um, but he drew this one yesterday. And what I thought was cool about this, and Cody will appreciate it. So this was kind of his first real attempt at pencil, you know, pencil sketch and then inking. And he was using, again, these proper ink pens. Again, now that he's getting kind of into manga style. So this was his first ink attempt. And then later, just today, just before the stream, he revisited the same character and did the same pencil ink and then added color pencil as well. So, you know, just, I just love seeing it. Proud dad, but also successfully executed. Very proud son, very well done. Okay, so with that, 
let's go to Premiere. So I've already got this screen open. I'm going to close this real quick. We'll come back to that. And we're going to start here because this is, if you are completely new to Premiere, this is the first thing you're going to see. Now, remember, a couple of weeks ago, we had that stream where I was showing you some of the new beta features, specifically the redesigned UI UX import export, which makes finding and kind of starting the process a lot easier. That's in the beta. So not everyone's using the beta, not everybody wants to. So we're going to cover the existing July 16th, 2021 import experience for starting projects today. Okay. Now, again, this may change when that other version eventually sees the light of day. Um, but this is how you're going to do it today in the proper release version. So up in the top left, you'll see you've got your new project button here. And this is where you're going to start. Also, for those of you using Rush, just I had some questions about this uh, midweek. If you work in Rush, you can also open Rush projects created on mobile directly inside of Premiere right here. So this makes things really, really super easy. Uh, so you're going to go to new project. All right. Hold on. I'm just sending a message here. Because we are live and I can't answer. And you're going to give it a name and we'll call it uh, my first edit. Tell it where you want it to go. All right. I usually stick things uh, in this folder here. Let's make a dump folder, which I empty after every stream. Now, there's a lot of things, a lot of different various settings in here. If you're new to Premiere, here's the awesome thing. You don't really need, you don't need to change any of this, okay? Just real quickly, you've got uh, video rendering and playback. And this is basically saying if it sees that you've got an accessible GPU, it's going to enable that GPU for you. What is GPU? The GPU is your graphics card, and it's going, Premiere is going to use that to accelerate playback, among many other things like adding effects and other stuff. You don't have to do this. You don't have to touch it. It's already going to be selected for you. If you want to dive a little deeper, you can see the other options in here. I'd go with the recommended GPU. In this case, we're on uh, Mac OS. It's going to suggest Metal. You saw OpenCL was in there. That's since been de deprecated, but you can still use it. Or software only, which is fine, but you're not going to get any accelerated playback or accelerated effects playback or rendering. So you can leave that alone. These other things here, uh, I haven't changed these in two decades, so you won't likely need to either. Your display format, again, you know, if you're wanting to work in feet and frames or just frames, good for you. Time code is pretty much how we all work. Audio, you're going to display it in milliseconds. Again, very no reason to display in audio samples at all. Someone give me a reason to display in audio samples. As an audio nerd, tell me why. I don't know why that's even there. That's completely useless. At 48,000 samples per second, not a, not something you ever need to change. And then capture format. Again, this is if you're actually using, if you're capturing from tape. So DV, HDV, that's what this is for. I actually recently had to do this because during my sabbatical, I wound up trying to transfer a bunch of old DV tapes. That's uh, for another day. And then color management here. Now, this may seem like something important. Honestly, this is not something you're going to have to change either, because if you're new to Premiere, if you're already working in HDR, and you're kind of aware of those concepts, then you're going to have a better idea of what all of these things do. If you're not, you needn't worry about this setting at all. Last two things here, just real quickly. Again, for anyone who's used Photoshop, your scratch disks, same concept here. Where does your captured video and audio go? Your audio and video previews, auto saves, CC libraries downloads, because of course CC libraries is integrated into Premiere. And then where do you store motion graphics template media that you use in the project? Essentially, this is all going to go into these default locations. Keep it simple. Keep it safe. Um, if you're going to be you know, creating stuff that you want to archive off later, place it in, a, in the local folder wherever your media is stored. You can place it wherever you want. Again, you generally never have to change the defaults. And we're not going to worry about ingest for right now. This is, again, slightly more advanced. This just allows you options to convert the media on import to um, to verify the media on import. If you're new, you really don't need to mess about with this. There's other videos where I've covered that. So we'll get back to that later. We've done it. We've given it a name. We told it where we want it to go. And we click OK. And here we are. OK. All right. So at this point now, this is where we can begin the process of importing our footage. Now, this is one of the things that we redesigned in this beta that I showed, which is I mean, this is kind of scary, right? And you've heard people talk about this. I've certainly heard people, colleagues, Terry White has talked about, you know, that first moment you open InDesign and there's just that blank, just white canvas. Same in Photoshop, right? Same in, in Illustrator, same in After Effects. It's all kind of the same. It's just something very scary about this. There's just a lot of text on screen and it's very dark. <laughs> all right. 
Easiest way to import footage, three easy ways. Right here, you'll see, now again, your interface may not look exactly like mine, but up in the project panel, okay? In the project panel, in the center of the panel, it says import media to start. So you can simply double click right there inside of the project panel, navigate to a drive. So let's say here, 2020, and go into this SFAZ folder here. And you know, here's where I have a bunch of different quick times and things. Now this is okay. I mean, I can see, you know, the file type. I could, you know, change my viewing options in here, I suppose, how I how I list them if I wanted to use icons instead. Again, this is kind of using the operating system, so you, you just don't get a lot about what's really in the footage here. We can of course preview it, I guess, technically if we want. You can multi-select things like this. Uh, maybe grab a couple pieces of footage here, click import, and it's going to appear in your project panel. And now you're going to see all of the attributes of that content, right? The name, the frame rate, the start and end, the duration. You know, you can also modify um, what fields of metadata you're seeing here. So this is all 4K content. Some of the audio is 44.1, some of it's uh, mono, some of it's 48K stereo, okay? Some of these exported files, some of these raw files right off the iPhone. So all that media is in. I don't love bringing in media that way because again, it's just sort of, it's, it's separated from, you don't really know what you're grabbing. So you also have the option to use the media browser. Now, if you don't see the media browser, you can find it under the window menu. You can actually see that I have two of them open here. They're already docked in this panel up here. The media browser, just as it sounds, and you've probably seen it in other Adobe apps as well, allows you to navigate to any drive, any connected device on your system. You can rescale these thumbnails that we see here. And then as I hover over them, I can actually see what is inside of each of those pieces of footage. So just in terms of starting the import process, this is way easier because I can really get a good idea like, okay, yeah, this take, yeah, that's good. This one, that's okay. You know, what is it? This one here. Yeah, there's like a lot of, yeah, it's like not really a particularly great shot. I don't need that. So again, I can just quickly visually review, see if it's the piece of footage I want, if there's duplicates or, you know, multiple takes of the same shot and then choose the one that I want. So in the same way, I can make a selection here. All right, I can scrub through it with a little play handle if I so desire. All right, go ahead and select my footage like this, okay? And then depending upon where you have the media browser docked, I can grab the footage and actually drag it over to the project panel. So I just took my mouse and dragged it over to the other dockable tab right here, let go. And all of that media now lives right here as well, okay? And I can turn this into thumbnails and again, see all of my footage. We're gonna to get to the third option here in a second. What's cool with the media browser is if you go up to the flyout tab, you'll see that you have an option here to add a new media browser panel, which I believe I already did, yes. So um, I have a couple of different panels of footage open simultaneously. So here's uh, this one from the hills. Here's another one of footage that I shot in uh, South Africa. So again, just a quicker, easier way to kind of organize and see what's on disk, quickly review the content here. So here was like a little time-lapse uh, sunrise. Here's another one, this might be the un Untimely, yeah, that's like the real time version. All right, let's grab some of these. Okay, some lions, some tigers, no bears. Oh my, uh, hippo and water, driving, giraffe. Okay, and same thing. I'm going to click and drag over to my project panel. Notice how I like tabbed through them there, just kept the button down, didn't let go. Release. <laughs> and all my footage is in here now, okay? Now, once you've got that footage in there, now we can start to play around and kind of organize or storyboard out what we're trying to do, how we're gonna begin organizing this content to build a timeline. So before we do that, let me just check on the chats here. Max Ruiz, I see, is Adobe optimized for the new Apple M1 Mac chip. So currently right now, Max, as of today, the existing beta for Premiere Pro Audition and I believe Rush desktop are all M1, fully, uh, fully native M1 in the betas. These will be coming to the full release versions of those applications 
very soon, okay? For today, Premiere Audition, and I think Premiere Rush, don't quote me on that 100%, are M1 native in the beta versions. So again, if you wanted to access those, you can go up to your Creative Cloud, go into beta apps, and you can download them right here, okay? Um, that will be coming to the release app. It's just not in there today, all right? Great question, though. Love that. And of course, I think already, uh, I don't know if Photoshop or Lightroom or all, a couple of our other apps already have the native M1 versions commercially available. I don't remember which, but for video, that's where we are right now, okay? Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Reverb mic still hook up to an old beta SP machine. All the tapes are long gone though, right? I know. And I'll tell you what, finding those, uh, finding those DV tapes, just, I had two different devices to play them back on. And then it was like, oh, I don't have a capture card that does it anymore. Or I, I didn't think I did. I found one. It's very old black magic device, you know, no, no longer a driver for it under Mac OS. It was a, it was a hassle. And ultimately the footage was kind of like, nah, it's a memory. <laughs> so I didn't even transfer it. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Oh, that's very kind. Eric Guma, Jorge de la Mora. All right, nice to see you there. Allison Marquette, like father, like son. Oh, you are very kind. Thank you for that. Did I pose for that, Jason Levine? Well, you know, I am a, a, a fitness gym junkie, so, you know, but no, that was... <laughs> he did not model that Goku character after my, uh, after my physique. Oh, thank you. And Sarah, you've got my Instagram. I'm not super big on Instagram, but uh, I try and post there occasionally. I, I'm very infrequent. I'm trying to do more. All right, Anika, great to see you. Okay, so let's get to it. Back to, this, back to the interface here. All right, so down below at the bottom of the project panel, all right, you've got three ways to view content. List view, icon view, which we just saw a moment ago, and then the freeform view, all right? Now, let me just real quick. Icon view is exactly what you think. You're seeing the footage as icons, okay? You can kind of storyboard things out. We can move things around. Oh, it looks like I only selected the one piece of footage from Africa. Let me, let me grab let me grab a couple more of those shots. I wanted more of those. Because they're just so, so cool. Um, make sure I just multi-select. I don't think I had my, my uh, command button down. All right, this will be good enough for right now. Drag these over. Boom, more footage. Okay, so with the icon view, again, you can do some basic storyboarding, but it's all—it's always going to be very linear. So you can you can reorganize how things appear, but it's always this you know left to right, top down sort of order. Um, you can also, from within the footage here, as you begin what we call making your selects, right? So this is like a long. <laughs> there's some uh, rhino butt right there. This is a long clip of rhinos. I love this shot where, you know, the rhino is looking at me and wanting to, uh, you know, attack here. Um, I don't necessarily need the shot of the butts, although it is sort of cool and artistic and the light, which is completely natural, is beautiful. I don't need that in my shot today. So I can set my in and out points here as well. I do that by using I and O on the keyboard. This is the selection, the piece of this footage that I want to use in my sequence, in my story. So I want the very beginning here. I'm going to shuttle to the beginning, hit I, okay? And I can use my JKL keys, or I can simply scrub through. So J to reverse, K to pause, L to go forward, or I can click and drag the cursor here. All right. So let's go back to the beginning. I drag right where I turn away, like that. O. And now that little section that you see there in blue, that's the section that will be added to my timeline, okay? That's my select. That's my selection. So you can make your selections of your content here, but you're organizing very linearly, all right? Now enter freeform view. And the freeform view is just that. So this essentially becomes your video artboard, all right, to relate this to, um, to sort of a Photoshop, uh, Photoshop terminology, all right? meaning that I can freely move content around easily. I can resize individual clips. So let's say like this is a hero shot, this San Francisco skyline shot. Right click down at the bottom of the menu here. I don't know if you can see that. 
it says clip size. All right, and I can make this extra large because this is like a hero shot. And note, it's now bigger than everything else. Maybe this one of the of the sun is also a hero shot. Same thing, clip size, extra large. Okay, maybe these will like anchor this edit. And then as I come through here, we'll have a couple more. Again, maybe I can make this one large, whatever. I'm just gonna start stacking these things together. Same thing here, by the way, uh, as I'm moving footage around, maybe there's a piece of this that I want. Well, let's just happen there. All right, so I'm gonna make this bigger so I can see it better, large. And then I'm going to click inside and I'm going to set my in and out point here. Okay, maybe I want this little, this little tilt as he's riding, so I'm I for in. This is also in slow-mo. It's a little tilt down to the bike and the road, set my out point, okay, right there. And then I want that to follow the rhino. And then maybe we'll go into the, uh, the uh, leopard at night. I'm gonna use that whole shot in this silhouetted leopard. Then maybe I'll take this clip right here, and then this clip right here, and then another shot of San Francisco at sunset, and then sabi sabi sunrise, okay? You get the idea. You can reorganize this, you can group, you can move things around. Uh, you even have snapping, which, let's see, is it the command key? No, uh, no, that, that just duplicated it. Sorry, I didn't want to do that. Option key? Yes, the option key. So option or control, or yeah, control on Windows, um, will snap the videos together. If you're like me and you're kind of OCD and you just need things like just clicked in place, uh, it'll snap together like that. What is significant about this? Well, first and foremost, you can start to lay out multiple stories. So maybe all of this doesn't exist in one timeline. Maybe you have multiple timelines, or maybe you just wanna organize by day or by city or by country or by whatever, Freeform lets you do that. It's just like artboards. Here's the other super cool thing about this. I can save this as a layout, all right? So I can save it as a layout, it's like an artboard layout, so I can come back to it later. Also, you can align things to a grid if you wanna do that, but let's go ahead and save this as a layout. And we'll call this uh, uh, first edit 01, okay? Now, let's say I start doing more here. So I'm gonna grab all of these shots down here and let's group resize them. So I just selected across them. Is this gonna let me multi-select? It's not letting me. And my right click isn't working for some reason. All right, let's just place these down here. I'm not gonna worry about that. Again, I can stack, I can snap whatever feels comfortable for you. Okay, maybe we have this one in there at the beginning that has some text on it. Place this over the end here. Now this is a new layout, right? Right click, save as new layout. First edit 02. So I did this, I'm like, ah, you know what? I kind of lost my story idea. What was that first one? Right click, restore layout. First edit 01. Everything goes back to the way it was. All right. Freeform artboard, video artboard, video canvas. Call it what you want. This is a really neat way to work. And then once I have my footage in the order that I want it, I'm going to select the first clip, hold down shift, select the last clip, and I'm going to right click here and I'm going to choose new sequence from clip. And this will now build the sequence in that order with that footage automatically for me, all right? So now, here we are down in the timeline. I'm gonna hit space bar to play it back. You know, this is, uh, go ahead and just kind of scrub through this, not really moving a lot in that footage. Okay, so some of this is different resolution. So again, those iPhone clips, those were 4K. Uh, this other stuff happens to be 1080p. So I'll talk to you about this in just a second, how we can scale this to all fit the same. Now. If you're mixing 1080 and, and 4K together, which many of us do, you've got to decide, am I going to blow footage up? Am I going to enlarge things? Or am I going to scale the other stuff down? If you've got, you know, well-exposed 
And it doesn't have to be on an RE Alexa. If you've got well-exposed, good-looking 1080p, you can do a basic scale to uh, set to frame size, scale to frame size in Premiere, which I'm gonna show you, and it's gonna look great. Typically, if you wanna maintain the best quality, probably cut at 1080 and scale the 4K stuff down, all right? For obvious reasons, right? It's just like images. If you're gonna take something smaller and blow it up, we've got a lot of new algorithms, including super resolution, which will make things look a lot better. But at the expense of, there may be a little pixelation, um, particularly with video, right? Now, if it's like 422, super high quality, 10-bit, 1080p, not really an issue. This stuff is, this is like 10-year-old uh, Nikon DSLR footage. It still looks pretty great. But again, I'll leave that up to you. How do you do the quick rescale? Well, like here, I've got three clips in a row that I see need it. Four, five, okay, so just these right here. I'm gonna select all of these clips in the timeline. Right click on one of them and go to scale to frame size. And everything blows up, so now it's all 4K. All right, just like that. Now, like I said, and it really, I mean, if you take a look here, here, I'll, I'll let me play this back at uh, full res for you here. I mean, look at the detail. It's, it's sharp, it's clean, right? And this isn't using some crazy, uh, you know, AI algorithm. This is just literally scaling it in the timeline. There are more, I won't say more efficient, no. There are better uh, ways to upscale things. Get into that again later. I've also got a video on that using detail preserving upscale, which take a lot of time to do, by the way. For most things, this is probably gonna work for you. Again, I recommend scaled down. So if you've got large footage, no smaller than 1080p, but if you've got a mix of 1080p and 4K and 6K and 8K and whatever, probably work in 1080 and scale everything else down. It's just gonna look better overall, but this looks pretty great, all right? So scale the frame size, just like that. We've now got all of our footage. Oh, and this last one needs to be rescaled too. Our little uh, time-lapsed sunrise there. That was shot with, um, so that's a, a Nikon D800 with a 400 millimeter lens with the 2X extender, uh, sick. And that sun, I mean, it, it was that big. Like it's, it was just, just breathtaking. What I love about this shot, again, as you can see, it's early morning. There's like amazing detail in the shadows here, you know? And this is, um, I wouldn't say it's color treated. I'd say it's it's been normalized, so shot flat and just put the color back in. Um, nothing, nothing fancy, no LUTs or anything like that. So that's just the look of that particular lens. So pretty cool. All right. So let's see what we have here. Just a couple of questions. Beautiful. Thank you, Cody. Abdelak. Okay. Allison. Okay. Thank you. All right. Da -da -da -da. Yes, you can watch the replay. Uh, Ferry, what format do you recommend to record videos with a camera? So yeah, you know, a lot of this you're not gonna have any control over. You know, most of our media that's coming, like, and I'll be the first to say, I, I, these days, I mean, I love my, I'm a Nikon guy, so I love my D850, it's 4K. If I'm shooting 4K for real, that's what I'll use. Um, I could go to an external recorder via the clean HDMI out, and I would probably record in ProRes if I had my choice. Uh, through an Atomos device or something like that. But, you know, I don't own one of those, so typically I'm just recording natively right to the card, which is generating, you know, QuickTime uh, H.264s, right? So that's really the format that most of our cameras are generating, some flavor of H.264 compressed. You know, again, we can get into the details of converting to other formats because H.264 isn't really the most optimized for playback and for editing, but that's what almost all of us use. Especially if you're just shooting on your phone, that's what you're making. You're making you're making MP4 files essentially. All right. But if you have the option, right? You know, um, obviously ProRes, uh, DNX, DNX HR, DNX HD. That's kind of the AVID standard. Um, these are the two most common. Cinema, uh, um, not Cinema 4D. What was I just going to say? It'll come back to me in a second. <laughs> Those are the two most common, you know, MXF. Some of your cameras are gonna shoot an MXF. A lot of it's gonna to have to do with, do you have bit rate options? You know, if you shoot an 8-bit, again, this is no different than shooting JPEG versus RAW. If you're shooting 8-bit, 
If you're new to video, think of that as shooting JPEG, all right? You're losing a lot of data at the sensor. You're just, it's, you're getting rid of it. So, you know, this footage can still look good, but you do have kind of a limitation on how much you can do to that footage without some kind of visual degradation. And that visual, that might be a very small amount, but that's the nature of 8-bit. If your camera does 10-bit, 12-bit, now you just have greater latitude when it comes to color correction and color processing in particular and exposure processing. You're just gonna have more latitude with less noticeable visual degradation over time. All right. So that's why your pro cameras, you know, most are connected to external devices or they're already shooting natively in ProRes or DNX or something like that or MXF generally at 8 or 10 bit. And not all 8 bit is the same, by the way. <laughs> you know, you can have a compressed 8 bit H.264 that's 40 megabits. It's getting very nerdy. Um, that looks amazing and you can really do crazy color stuff to it. And it, it really still looks good at whatever size you're in. Or you can have you know, 8-bit uh, H.264, 5 megabit footage. I'm thinking of some of my old Canon, uh, like power shoot that shot 1080p video. They were just, they were really low bit rates. So even though the footage in its kind of native form looked great, the moment you started to color correct it, it just, you'd get a lot of, a lot of block, you know, blocky pixelated looking things. Uh, just a lot of noise, you know. So not all are created equal, but Hopefully that kind of answers your question there. Okay. That reminds me of a Disney movie. Okay. Very cool. All right. So we've done import. We've done uh, uh, creating the sequence. Oh, and by the way, if you're so inclined as well and you want to, you know, just kind of throw everything into a sequence, if you're in list view, the traditional view here, you can also do this by selecting everything, right clicking and choosing new sequence from clip. Okay. You can do that. By the way, uh, if you were wondering, well, how did it know to take 4K and make this timeline 4K? The first piece of footage in that freeform selection, this, this was a 4K shot. Now, let me, let me do this. Let's say I wanted to take this footage here and make this into a timeline. So let's do that. New sequence from clip. All of this footage happened to be 1080. The first clip was 1080, so it's a 1080 timeline, okay? It chooses the first clip in the sequence. And let's keep me honest here. <laughs> Is it gonna work? Let's see. So I chose now a 4K piece of footage. Oh, I'm sorry, let me do this. 1080 is first, let's put 4K at the end. New sequence. Okay, so 1080, 1080, 4K, right? So now the 4K footage is oversized because the first clip in my selection in Freeform was 1080. So if I want this 4K now to fit into that 1080 window, right click, scale to frame size, there it is, okay? So it's whatever the first piece of footage that you select is that ultimately determines the, um, the aspect ratio and the attributes of your sequence, okay? Make sense? Okay. Uh-oh, since we're talking export options, I always observe a weird white outline when exporting an alpha channel. Am I doing something wrong? Well, Annika, I don't know. Um, yes, you should not be experiencing that now. If you're doing green screen keying, I don't know what you're exporting that requires alpha, probably I'm assuming some kind of green screen or maybe it's text or if it's graphical elements. Um, if you're getting some kind of weird ghosting or graphical element, um, it could, depending upon, I don't know what format you're exporting in. There's only a few that are really ideal for, um, for exporting with alpha channel. ProRes 444 being one, uh, quick time animation in the past. I don't recommend that at all because it's just a really old heavy codec. I think there's a DNX flavor that supports alpha. There's a couple other um, uh, a couple other formats that support alpha as well, but probably need a little more detail. You, you should not see, again, that's usually an artifact of something wasn't keyed correctly or there's some kind of anti-aliasing applied to your text or something that you can, you can defeat, whether you're, if you're doing it in After Effects or wherever, but probably need a little more detail on what it is that you're doing. Yeah, graphical elements. Okay, so yeah, so there's, it's probably something in the text style that you have that's causing this weird glow or ghost. 
Um, and we can chat about that a little later because that's that's kind of a different story. But yes, it is solvable. It is resolvable. It just depends on what the nature of it is. If you want to hit me up on Twitter and show me an example, I can probably tell you how to fix it. OK. All right. So um, so that's making our sequence. We've got about 20 minutes left. Let's start talking about the tools. OK. So I'm going to go into our, uh, our first little sequence that we made here. All right. With our mix of footages. Just love that rhino shot. Terry White was right next to me. Actually, Paul was with me too when we when we got this footage. He might also have uh, some images of this great beast. We were, I kid you not, maybe maybe seven feet away from this gargantuan creature. <laughs> thank God it you know does it. Thank God it's a, it's an herbivore because uh, they're still mean, but. Um, because it was massive, and I was very terrified hand-holding a 400 millimeter lens to shoot that, by the way. Uh, it was pretty crazy. All right, so tools. Now, again, yours may not be in the same location. Here's what the tools panel looks like, all right? First tool, selection tool, also known as the Adobe Move tool, standard shortcut key V. As I've said many times on Masterclass streams, it is one of probably uh, so Allison, seven feet? Yeah, no joke. <laughs> no joke. Really, really close. Seven feet and in an open Jeep, and I'm standing at the back of the Jeep with the lens like this, stable. That's why That's why the sh shot is so tight, because the animal is so close, coupled with this massive lens. So yeah, very, very close indeed. Um, how do we survive? <laughs> you have to watch some of the other footage, because we came within inches of uh, a sleepy uh, leopard that we found in the in the dark that you saw there and it brushed up against the Jeep and you could hear uh, our guy this is also at night in complete darkness saying no sudden movements from the back <laughs> yeah it was terrifying okay um, all right what was it talking about tools okay so this is the classic Adobe move tool right you want to move stuff around in your timeline pick up footage and move it, adjust the track position, you do just that, okay? Now, by the way, while we're here, while I've actually got footage in this timeline, something else I wanted to show you too. Um, I showed you making a sequence from, by selecting multiple clips at a time. If you have a clip, let's say I have something that I want to insert right here before this. Maybe I want to put this, uh, this other piece of footage. Let's see, what is this one? Let's find something else. Let's do this SF sun sunset warm clouds. Let's say I want to place this one right here. I can also take that footage and drag it on top of the program monitor here. And this gives me a series of what we call drop zones. So now, if you can read that on screen, I can drop this footage before. So d based on where my cursor is, I can drop it before the footage. I can insert it right where the cursor is. I can overlay it over top of the footage that's after the cursor, right? So onto its own track. I can replace what's underneath. I can overwrite, or I can insert after. So this is something that most people never discover because you're usually not dragging footage onto the program monitor. But this is really, really helpful. So if I just wanted to insert this right here before this rhino. So now we have two pieces. Oh, it's actually the same clip, it looks like. <laughs> we have two instances of this clip before the rhino, OK? Or you know, again, if I were in this one here, I'm just going into some of the 1080 footage. And uh, do we have the giraffe in this one at all? OK, let's put a giraffe in there. So let's say I want the giraffe you know, to be overlaid right here for some reason, all right? Let's overlay the giraffe. So again, now it's on its own track. So it didn't destroy anything underneath. It's just now cutting to that giraffe. And now if I so desire, I can trim this back so that it cuts to the next shot, which is our, uh, our cyclist. Miles, okay. Miles, Miles. So it transitions from that. Let's kill our, uh, kill our audio here. Again, all this handheld using our old warp stabilizer algorithm, you know, transitions to our cyclist, OK? All right. So that's our, our little drop zones. OK, but back to tools. So again, tools allow us to move things around. Now, as you just saw, with the move tool or the selection tool, I can simply trim 
the edges of my content in the timeline. Just by going to the extreme left or right, you see it turns into this left arrow, right arrow cursor, and I can drag the end like this, and I can drag the beginning, all right? Now, if I want to say, you know, I dragged in this whole giraffe clip, maybe there's just a piece of this that I want to bring into my timeline. Well, from the project panel, I can double click to launch it in the source monitor, or directly from the timeline, I can double click this footage, and that also brings me into the source monitor. Now, this is yet another way to make your select, like your best, the best moment that you want to bring into your footage here. I can do that. So, like, I like this little bit at the end. Where was the bit with the bugs? It's somewhere around here. It's close up on his head. Oh, that's right here. You can see all the flies. So maybe I want this to be the in and that to be the out, okay? Notice, because that footage was already in my timeline, it automatically cut and adjusted the in and out for me of that content. Let's say, no, you know what? I want this, I want our guy to keep walking here. I'm going to click and drag, extending my out point. You see I'm doing that in the source monitor. Let me see if I can zoom in on that. So, okay, I'm just dragging the out point right here with my cursor. Now pay attention to the to the sequence right there. The little clip got longer, right? Because we're adjusting the in and out via the source. So you can do it there in advance. You can do it here, all right, with the selection or move tool, however you want to do it. Very, very simple. So the key is, though, is that this just drags the edges. This is not performing what is known as a ripple, which is where you, you know, slice off five seconds and everything that was next to it moves along with it. We'll get to that tool in a second. But this is an important one to know because you're going to use this a lot. You're going to be trimming edges and making adjustments. Very, very useful. Okay, the tool below that is the Track Select Forward tool. Now, what this one does, strangely named, you select the track that you're on and the piece of footage you want, and then it's going to move all the footage to the right simultaneously, um, all adjacent footage in a single click. Now, this is really useful because a lot of times, again, sometimes you're doing weird inserts or if you're crafting a story, I don't know how many pieces of footage I need to place there, but I want to take everything, everything that's to the right of that cursor, it's kind of done. I know it's like in a basic, almost finished mode. So I can move everything off this is just a really quick way to do that. By the way, you could also just take the selection tool, multi-select footage, and do the same thing, okay? The reason why this particular one is useful, now, I don't, none of these timelines are very long, um, is because if you have a lot of audio files, and sometimes, you know, with sound design, you'll have very, very small pieces. Maybe you didn't catch it. Maybe it's 20 tracks down. Well, you don't have to worry about that if it follows linearly this piece of footage or after, all I have to do is click this toppermost one and everything's going to move along with it, okay? So that's just a nice way, again, just revealing the tools here. Also, shortcut key A on the US keyboard to move everything to the, you know, globally with a single, uh, with a single uh, tool. Okay, now we have the ripple edit tool, all right? Now, this one is... For me, you know, this is the most common one that I use. And I usually use this. This is, again, one of the six or seven keyboard shortcuts that I know, um, which on the Mac uh, is also, I think it's also the, if you're in the selection tool, I always have to remind myself, with the selection tool, so again, our classic Adobe Move tool, if I hold down the Command key, it turns into this yellow, um, yellow icon that is, indicating that this is a ripple edit, all right? If I just grab the ripple edit tool by itself, it is already yellow. And what the ripple edit tool does is as described, okay, I'm just, I'm zoomed in here. I know you wanna see the video, but so you can see what it's doing. You know, I decide, okay, yeah, I only need the first 10 seconds or whatever, or I can actually see my duration here. I only want, yeah, 15 seconds of the hippo and water buck. I'm going to cut that down and when I release, all the footage that was, again, to the right of that ripples to this new edit position versus if I'm in the um, selection or move tool, if I do the same thing and go back, I only want 15 seconds. Now there's just a hole, right? So the ripple moves everything 
and snaps everything together. Some other audio uh, video apps refer to this as like a magnetic, they, like they call their timelines magnetic timeline. Rush is a magnetic timeline. It's always rippling. It's actually doing that by default. It's always, it's never leaving a hole. It's never leaving space. Here, being a more sort of, you know, full featured editor, you have the options here. So you can leave a hole, you know, maybe you're gonna put stills, whatever, B-roll in there, um, or you can use the ripple tool, right, to do what most of us wanting to do, which is, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna shrink this up, you know, and just move everything over, all right? Really simple, really easy. Now, let's take this a step further where you have, I'm gonna, and I'm just going to, uh, I'm gonna make some little in-out adjustments on this footage real quickly because I wanna show you the uh, sort of slip and slide concept here, which is for, if you've ever done traditional assembly editing, may look familiar to some of you. All right, so if you double click between two clips, you'll see that you get yet another icon here. And this is going to allow you now to adjust the out point of the previous clip and the in point of the adjacent clip, right? You can see, if you look at the monitor here, those negative numbers that you're seeing next to the tools, that's saying, you know, we're going 35 frames back, we're going 12 frames ahead, et cetera, et cetera. So this is allowing you to see, you know, this clip ends right there, he's smiling at the camera, and that clip begins right there, 1345, 2206, et cetera, okay? So you can make that change right there. So when you play this back, smiles at the camera, cuts right to there, all right? Some people like editing that way. When you used to do assembly editing, I used to edit like that all the time. I must admit, now, I, I, don't, I don't do that very often. How do you get into that window again? Just double click between two clips and it'll pull up this window and then you'll see that you have your I don't remember what they, did we call this slip and slide? I don't remember what we call this. Shuttle? I don't remember what it's called. I don't remember. You could also apply a default transition here, which is, I think, a cross dissolve. If we wanted to cross dissolve between those two, that, that editing environment lets you do that. You can also just trim backward one frame, five frames, plus one, plus five. You get the idea. And the reason that went black is because we ran out of frames there, right? That's why I was trimming the edges ahead of time. So again, just another useful way that you can do that. Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing here real quickly. I'm just going to uh, ripple this up for a second because we're gonna go to our next tool. Oh, and then we have the razor tool. So this is shortcut key C, US keyboard. This one is obvious. You're making cuts, right? So down here below, we wanna cut this up into a couple of different pieces, and then again, hit and move stuff around, I use the razor tool for that, okay? It is no, no, no secret, no surprise there, right? You've got something that's super long and you wanna cut it into different sections, all right? You choose your razor tool and you cut, and now you can, again, use your move tool or selection tool and move things around, okay? Simple stuff, every editor has the razor tool really easy. Okay. Next, we're almost out of tools here. This one is called, oh, this is, okay, this is our slip tool. So the slip tool allows you to adjust where you are in the video. So now if you already took the entire clip, so remember we were making our in and out selections. In this case, I have the entire giraffe piece in my timeline. All right. Do I? Primarily. Almost. Super long clip here. Okay. I'm gonna shrink this up because we're editing this, all right? And where I am in this edit right here, I, I, don't, I don't like this starting point right there. I wanna, I wanna go back in time. So I can select my slip tool. And again, now I can shuttle back in time and say, oh, I want it to start there where I've got sort of the close up on the face and the bugs, all right? And it okay. adjusts the start time yeah. I mean, that's a new like that, that okay? So before it was starting here, I missed that beautiful giraffe chomping, use my slip tool and go, no, 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 I want, I want to start here. All right. So this just allows you to readjust, you know, it's like you're, 
you're literally like scrub, scrubbing through the media, front and back, on screen, finding where you wanted to start in this particular part of the cut, the slip tool, all right? And it doesn't affect anything below. So again, whereas we saw that side-by-side -side assembly editing where we were adjusting the in and out of the adjacent clips, this isn't touching anything on any other track. This is only affecting what we're seeing in this giraffe clip, okay? And then your last three tools, you have the pen tool here, which is largely for um, if you're going to be doing any kind of masking and things, and we'll get into that in another episode. Um, then you have your hand tool, which is again to move elements around outside of video, I'm not gonna need that here. And then your text tool, type tool, which is just that. Uh, if you're gonna begin typing, you know, some kind of text via essential graphics. All right, and we wanted to type something like this. Okay, giraffe. Um, we could place text, it creates our little motion graphics block down here. Okay, you can also do, if you hold it down, vertical type. So we could start another vertical type, right? And do some vertical type there, you know, whatever, all right? This is also a very cool feature that we added. Notice we have little guides there, snapping guides. If you click on the flyout menu, this wrench settings menu, all right? Snap and program monitor. So you'll automatically get those snapping lines. And then as of a couple of versions ago, we have show rulers and show guides. So if you like the Photoshop style rulers, go ahead and turn those on. Now this is again, very essential for doing any kind of graphics positioning. Um, if you're building motion graphics in Premiere. And then just like in Photoshop, uh, you have the option here to show guides. So these are some standard uh, guides that I made. You can also move them around by clicking and dragging on them. You can also just by going to the edge, drag on your own new guides at the top and bottom of the ruler. Just like that. I don't know if you can see that I was grabbing new ones just by going to the top of the ruler and dragging a new guide down. You can also adjust the color of those guides. Um, you've got total flexibility here. You do add guide. So you can tell it, yeah, where the position starts out, the initial orientation and then the color. Okay. Um, unit, obviously you're going to want that in pixels. I don't know why you would ever want it in the percentage, but we have that option in there. All right. So guides, rulers, and again, if you don't want to see them, you can just choose to not see them. I usually leave the rulers on just for better alignment, okay? All right, and then lastly, last thing here in the last two minutes, transitions, which you will find under the effects panel, which you can find under the window menu. And here you'll have video transitions, dissolves, again, some of the classic ones here, cross dissolve, film dissolve, dip to white, dip to black. To apply them, you simply click and drag over top of two clips, all right? And you can see that it's now applied a little, oh, it's the same, <laughs> duh, I was cutting the same thing. So here, let me cut this. Whoops, and uh, quickly edit here. All right, so I can add a little dissolve for you between these two, all right? Just dissolving between different parts of the same clip, but you get the idea. Also, if we go into Essential Graphics, Adobe Stock, Transitions, free, right? This is going to show you all kinds of free graphical transitions that you can access. A lot of these I already have, so if there's one that you like, I'm gonna drag one into the timeline here, this visual trends one, okay? And I can place it between these clips. Let's shrink up the giraffe here. Okay, so again, graphical transition. This is coming directly from Adobe Stock versus your traditional cross dissolve, which we have on the biker and the giraffe there, okay? Or however you want it, okay? Really cool graphical ones, all part of Adobe Stock. All right, friends. So those are some basics for getting started with your first edit. They might say, well, but how do I export now? 
All right, well, that's that's basics part three. But just real quickly, if you just want to see the amazing work that you've done today, <laughs> look at the text. What is that font? File, export, media. Now, again, this is the non-simplified version. Um, this is very detailed. We're not going to get into this right now. I'm going to show you an even easier way. Make sure your sequence is selected. I have three sequences here. The selection will show you. You've got a white line under it, the blue line around it. With your sequence selected, upper right-hand corner of your screen, quick export. Click on it. Tell it where you want it to go. It's going to my desktop. Choose a preset. Okay, this is going to create an, H, an MP4, an H.264 for you in, you know, match the source, a high bit rate, or you can choose a specific high quality based on frame size, 4K, 1080, what have you, okay? Tells you the basic attributes, how big it's gonna be, how long, the estimated file size, click export, and you're done. And it's going to render this right now to your desktop, and that's it, and you've created a video, all right? So that is all the time we have today, my friends. Now we got our little notification, it's done. Very, very good. I wanna thank you so much for watching. We've got Julia coming up with the uh, Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge. So stick around for that. Thank you, Z, Give me, giving me a thumbs up. Appreciate that. It looks easy when you do it, Jason. Oh, thank you, Christelle. Tiffany, thank you. All right, Tim and Rick and Afrosia. Very great to see that. <laughs> Tim, no star wipe. Yeah, right. All right, and uh, until next time, have a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. We'll see you next week for uh, part two of Premiere Pro Editing Basics. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye.